Uh, I'd like to chat very briefly about uh, the neurobiology surrounding arousal and memory because in the context of a talk on interoperative awareness where we're going from uh, neurobiological principles, uh, it is important to think about these. I'm not going to go into them in detail, but if uh, you read our review article in the journal Anesthesiology, you'll get more background on some of the information that I'm presenting. So let me start with this figure, which is um, in the article by uh, Monsieur uh, Orser and Avedan. And uh, this is from work done by um, Ralph Leidig and Helen Bagdoyan at the University of Michigan. And what's shown over here are different nuclei that are involved in arousal states and then also in sleep promotion. Now we know more about wakefulness and non-REM non sleep than we know about uh, the anesthetic sleep and REM sleep as well. But essentially the thought goes that um, arousal and sleep promotion are critically dependent on nuclei in subcortical areas like the hypothalamus and the pons and the brainstem in general. So for example, if you look at the area uh, um, on the, the left hand side of the slide, all of the nuclei um, in red are active during wakefulness. Um, for example, the, the dorsal graphi, the um, um, arousal nuclei in the, um, in the brain stem, the locus ceruleus, um, the basal forebrain, the prefrontal cortex, which is uh, admittedly a cortical area, but most of these areas that promote uh, arousal are, are in the are, um, subcortical areas. There is also the, the ventrolateral prefrontal, uh, the, the ventrolateral prefrontal um, area, which is um, um, important in uh, promoting sleep, which is inactive during wakefulness. Um, not shown specifically on the slide because there isn't a specific nucleus, but in this posterior hypothalamic area, um, you have um, neurons, and not many actually, which is quite interesting, and that's why maybe they're vulnerable, which produce orexin, which is a, a potent arousal um, um, signal. And uh, orexin um, sends signals to many of these arousal nuclei um, to activate them and to promote arousal, which is incidentally why we discovered uh, just uh, over 10 years ago that an orexin deficiency is probably one of the major mechanisms involved in narcolepsy where people um, suddenly fall asleep. So when you have uh, the non-REM sleep uh, state compared with the wakefulness state, um, a lot of the nuclei that were active during wakefulness are now switched to the inactive state, um, including uh, the locus ceruleus, which produces norepinephrine, histamine-producing uh, nuclei, um, acetylcholine-producing nuclei, um, whereas the ventrolateral uh, pre preoptic area uh, is now active, and it sends out um, um, GABA, for example, as an inhibitory neurotransmitter to many of these nuclei to inhibit them and to cause a switch from a wake state to a sleep state. And that's actually brought about the, the hypothesis or the notion that there are flip-flop switches um, which lead to these mutually exclusive states that you flip between an awake state and an asleep state. Um, and this actually comes into the debate about whether consciousness transitions rapidly or gradually. So whether we flip in and out of consciousness or whether we slowly transition. And this debate is certainly not resolved. Um, regarding anesthesia, you can see that um, some of the nuclei that are um, active in non-REM sleep, especially the ventrolateral preoptic area, is probably also active in general anesthesia. And it's likely that general anesthetic agents like propofol and the volatile anesthetic agents um, um, have maybe some of their action by activation of this Vilpo area, which then sends inhibitory signals to many of the arousal pathways. We also know that some of the arousal pathways, like the uh, lateral-dorsal and uh, peduncular pontile tegmental area, are, are inactive, uh, as well as the uh, brainstem uh, arousal pathways, the uh, reticular formation becomes inactive. 
prefrontal cortex becomes inactive, but many of the other nuclei uh, which are inactive in non-REM sleep and are active in wakefulness, we're not sure of how they are uh, affected by, by general anesthesia. Although, for example, the locus ceruleus, which is norepinephrine producing, is probably inhibited uh, by um, alpha-2 adrenergic agents like dexmedetomidine. So this gives a sense of the, the nuclei uh, that are uh, integrally involved in arousal and in sleep and probably general anesthesia. And most of them are subcortical. This uh, slide just shows the interaction between the arousal and the inhibitory nuclei and the signals that they send with, uh, in this case, the, uh, the, the neurotransmitters that, um, that arise from each of the nuclei, like acetylcholine, GABA, galanine, histamine, dopamine, norepinephrine, and, uh, and serotonin. Um, so the ventrolateral preoptic uh, uh, nucleus uh, sends inhibitory signals to many of these arousal nuclei, and GABA is an important uh, neurotransmitter from the ventrolateral preoptic area. Uh, the tuberomammillary nucleus um, has histamine as an arousal um, um, transmitter, and it is probably inhibited by a propofol, for example. It's one of the probable targets for propofol as well as the ventrolateral preoptic area. It's important to note that it, in terms of action, most general anesthetic agents probably act on more than one pathway. They don't just have a single target as far as, as, far as we know. Um, and uh, it is going into the future, maybe more specificity in drugs will, will be a feature of drug development. Unlike um, arousal and sleep, experience and consciousness and memory formation probably requires much more important um, participation of higher uh, cortical function. So areas of the cortex are involved in um, explicit memory, implicit memory, and traumatic memory. This um, figure, which is also um, in our review article published in Anesthesiology, the Monsieur uh, Orser and Avedan paper, um, looks at different types of memory. And, and for intraoperative awareness, Remember that we're focusing on explicit memory. It's what people remember that traumatizes them. We don't know what the clinical significance is of implicit memory. And there may even be um, traumatic memory that is not explicitly remembered. And um, my bias is that that is um, uh, potentially important, but um, is not something that we can know about. These forms of memory, because there are different brain regions that are involved with them, are potentially dissociable. You can see how somebody could form implicit memories without them forming explicit memories, without there being long-term potentiation in the hippocampus, which is one of the key features probably leading to explicit memory formation. And key areas in implicit memory include the amygdala, which is situated here, medially in the brain, at the uh, head of the hippocampus. So, when uh, um, an explicit memory is formed, it usually requires wakefulness for about at least 30 seconds. Long-term potentiation has to occur. The memory needs to be coded. And there are various brain regions that tend to be involved in that process. So that was just a little bit for you about the neurobiology of arousal, uh, of sleep, and of memory, and how different forms of memory are dissociable from one another.